distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome young Amat Babagia Tun Dr. Mahabir Muhammad, the fourth Prime Minister of Malaysia and President of the Pradana Global Peace Foundation, and young Amat Babagia Tun Dr. Siti Hasma Muhammad Ali, advisor of the Pradana Global Peace Foundation. Assalamu alaikum, salam hormat, and a very good morning to young Amat Bahagir Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, the fourth Prime Minister of Malaysia and President of the Pradana Global Peace Foundation. Yang berhormat Dato Mukhristu Mahathir, the Deputy Minister of International Trade and Industry in Malaysia. Distinguished guests, Speakers, moderators, your excellencies, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Pradana Global Peace Foundation and the Kuala Lumpur Foundation to Criminalize War, welcome to the International Conference 9-11 Revisited, Seeking the Truth. <laughs> Why revisit 9-11? For the simple reason that our world changed that day. 3,000 souls perished and every single person on the face of the planet has never been the same. The world became a darker place. Fear became a tool for mass compliance and subservience for draconian measures in the name of security. Measures that realize the erstwhile fictional Big Brother. Millions have since lost their lives, collateral damage in the annals of time. 2012 marks its 11th anniversary, yet the culpability of those complicit in its planning and execution remains elusive. Even the recent memorial ceremonies and its attendees were reported to be more muted, ready to move on with their fractured lives. So why revisit 9-11? because history never forgets. And until the truth is exposed and those responsible duly dealt with, 
we should never stow away 9-11 into a neat little box in the history of the 21st century. Its sharp edges slowly blunting with the sands of time. No, we say, as in the words of a famous poet, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and honor to now invite Young Amak Bahagia Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, fourth Prime Minister of Malaysia and President of the Perdana Global Peace Foundation, to address us. Dipersilaka. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Excellencies, members of the panel, presenters, guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning to everyone. <coughs> Firstly, I would like to welcome everyone to this very important meeting or conference or forum. The Pradhana Global Peace Foundation would like to welcome presenters, participants, and all present to this extremely important forum on an issue that affects the whole world. The purpose of this forum is nothing less than the search for truth on an event that has serious consequences for us all. The Prana, Perdana Global Peace Foundation is doing the unthinkable. It is going to seek the truth about the destruction of the twin World Trade Center buildings in New York on 9-11, that is on the, on the 11th of September 2001. The immediate reaction to this unprecedented aerial attack in America was that it was the work of Muslim terrorists. The Al-Qaeda is especially identified as the organization behind this act. As a result, President Bush wanted to go on a crusade against Muslims. He later withdrew that statement, but in fact, his subsequent acts against the Muslims reflected this mindset. He attacked two Muslim countries, Afghanistan and Iraq, killing their people and destroying these two countries, destabilizing them and arresting the progress, their progress, even after knowing that the hijackers were not Afghans or Iraqis. The whole Muslim world became suspect. The Muslims are distrusted, subjected to humiliating discrimination and obtained detained without trial and tortured for at will for years in camps situated outside the jurisdiction of U.S. laws. In Guantanamo, Cuba, for example, and in Iraq, others were flown to countries where torture was practiced so they could be tortured and not break U.S. laws. Then, the U.S. actually passed a law legalizing torture, a retrogressive act most unworthy of its claims as the leaders of modern civilization. But the U.S. and Europe are even now paranoid that another similar attack might take place. 
security measures and laws have been tightened. All of them were clearly directed against Muslims. Muslim airline passengers have been subjected to hum humiliating searches. Shoes have to be taken off for examination. Toothpaste and hair creams and liquid cosmetics confiscated. Machines are developed to scan the whole body and at the slightest suspicion, passengers were hauled off for questioning and detention. The fact that Muslims have been more busy killing each other rather than Americans or Europeans has not changed the attitudes of the, of the Europeans. Perhaps it is because they feel guilty and expect revenge for the injustices perpetrated by them that they fear Muslims, any Muslim. And more than a decade since 9-11, obsessed with their own security to the detriment of the security of other people. The official explanation for the destruction of the Twin Towers is still about an attack by suicidal Muslim extremists. But even among Americans, this explanation is beginning to wear thin and to be questioned. In fact, certain American groups have thoroughly analyzed various aspects of the attack and destruction of the Twin Towers, the Pentagon building, and the reported crash in Pennsylvania. And their investigations reveal many aspects of the attack which cannot be explained by attributing them to attacks by terrorists, Muslims, or non-Muslims. Some of these Americans and many other prominent people have been invited by the Pradhana Global Peace Foundation to give their views on 9-11. These people have no ax to grind. They are only interested in seeking the truth. The truth is important because 9-11 has triggered attacks on Muslim countries and people in which hundreds of thousands have been killed and their countries devastated by the shock and all wars. I have thought a lot about 9-11. I have seen pictures and video clips of the attacks. I have heard the narrators give their opinion regarding the attacks. But to this, I would like to add my own opinion based on my observation of the Arabs at peace and at war. The Arabs may have been great warriors in the past, but after they fell under Western rule, they seem to have lost their prowess in wars. In, <clears throat> in their wars against Israel, they were so inept that they have never won a single battle, even when the forces for, for their forces far outnumbered the Israelis. In the years immediately after the formation of the State of Israel, the combined armies of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria were defeated by the smaller Israeli forces. The Arabs never seemed to be able to plan or strategize, and certainly their execution of battle plans are just plain bad. They are not a disciplined people and this lack of discipline shows everywhere. And they cannot keep anything secret. Someone would leak whatever plan they may have worked out. For money, there are Arabs who are prepared to reveal the hiding places of their leaders. The attack on 9-11th involved very complex elements which needed detailed planning, precise timings, and disciplined execution. There has never been, and will never be, I think, 
a hijacking of four large aircrafts simultaneously. Yet this was what was supposed to have happened. At apparently the same time, the hijackers took command of four aircrafts while flying in different airspace in different directions. We cannot know whether the hijackers carried gun arms, but there has been no report of guns in the debris of the four aircrafts. How then, how they could overwhelm the whole crew and take control of four aircrafts at about the same time is a mystery. Then the hijackers were supposed to make the aircrafts change course and fly to four different places. Pilots who realized they were going to die anyhow would have tried to steer away from the towers they, when it was obvious they were going to crash into them. It would not, be, it would not need much change of direction to miss the towers. But the planes hit the towers squarely, bursting into flames, apparently due to the fuel they carry. Maybe the hijackers were actually flying the aircrafts, but we are told they had only trained with small aircrafts. How did they know how to navigate the huge aircrafts to perfectly, so perfectly after changing course? and time was the essence. If the second plane was delayed, the, control, the ground control would have detected that there was something wrong with the second, the third, and the fourth aircrafts. I can imagine trained operatives like those in the CIA or Mossad planning and executing the complex operation but I cannot imagine an Arab like Osama bin Laden planning and directing the sophisticated aerial attack from some remote place in Afghanistan. They would need an airport control tower with sophisticated instruments to do this, and they would need to be near enough to observe the flights and give directions. The planning alone would have been extremely complex. Lots of data would have to be collected a long time earlier. The pilots had to be trained for, every, for, the, for very many years before they could fly and navigate the commercial aircrafts. The hijackers needed to take over the four aircrafts at about the same time while in flight. The aircrafts to be hijacked must be well selected so as not to be too far from the targets. The aircrafts had to be diverted at the right time for each to reach their targets at about the same time. All these would require a lot of detailed planning and deciding which planes should be hijacked to the number of hijackers for each plane to the different roles of hijackers to control the passengers and seize control of the aircrafts from the pilots to the change in the flight plan to the routes to be taken to forcing the pilots to take the new routes or for the hijackers to take over the piloting of the planes, etc., etc. Hijacking one aircraft is difficult enough, but hijacking four aircrafts and flying them so as to hit the targets at about the same time is an impossible task for amateurs. Even professionals would not find it would find it difficult to do. Yet four aircrafts crash at about the same time. I apologize to the Arabs, but planning and executing of these complex operations are not something that they can do very well. They are brave. 
They are brave and they are willing to die for their beliefs, but they are not like the American Marines who planned and carried out the assassination of Osama bin Laden. Their planning included the disposal of the body of the victim. They, and they are brilliant. This is something that they were trained for years to do. If the Arabs were to undertake such training, it would soon become known to the CIA or Mossad, and they would ensure that the whole operation be aborted. But the fact remains that four planes were hijacked and they all crashed on their targets. If the hijackers could not be Arabs, then who were the brilliant, the brilliant hijackers? Clearly, there is a need to know. For the event changed the world, making it insecure for everyone and launching a clash of civilization as predicted by Huntington. I may be wrong, of course, but this forum will hopefully reveal the truth behind the event of 9-11. The Pearl Harbor attacks forced the U.S. to join the Second World War. I don't think the Arabs plan to force the U.S. to go to war against the Muslim world. But 9-11 did just that. Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor did launch a horrific war which killed hundreds of thousands of 9-11. No, uh, started a horrific war which killed hundreds of thousands of Muslim, devastated Iraq and Afghanistan and made Muslims the universal enemies of the whole world. Someone obviously gained from this. Find the beneficiaries and I believe we will find the real terrorists. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference is about finding the truth regarding the world-shaking events of 9-11. Attempts will be made to black out reports on the talks and discussions here. They will be made by the very protagonists of free speech and the free press. But the alternative media will frustrate them and shed light on the events. The majority will probably conclude that the, re the revelations by the speakers are preposterous but a substantial number will believe or at least rethink their views of the events. As I said earlier, 9-11 has resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and Afghans, as well as a few thousand US and British soldiers. It, was, it has devastated two Muslim countries and destabilized them with fratricidal wars which promised to last a very long time. It has divided the world into Muslim and non-Muslim and sowed the seeds of suspicion and hatred between them. It has undermined the security of nations everywhere, forcing them to spend trillions of dollars on security measures. Yet the threat remains not so much from alleged terrorists as from the powerful states and their crusade to change the world. Truly, 9-11 is the worst man-made disaster for the world since the end of the two world wars. For that reason alone, it is important that we seek the truth because when truth is revealed, then we can really prepare to protect and secure ourselves. Finally, I would like to thank all the speakers for coming all the way to speak on this, at this forum. Their dedication to finding the truth is laudable. I would also like to thank those present 
for the support and their willingness to hear the views of the speakers despite the likelihood of their being shocked and disgusted with the behavior of those in whom we place our trust to create a better world for humanity. Now it is with great expectation, not great pleasure, but great expectation that I declare this conference on seeking the truth about 9-11 open. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mari Muhammad. Thank you for your absolute commitment in leading the charge with PGPF to seek the truth. And ladies and gentlemen, our journey continues and intensifies. We begin now with the first session, what really happened on 9-11. And with that, I would like to invite the chairman for the session, that is uh, General Retired Tan Sri Muhammad Azumi Muhammad, trustee of PGPF. And I would like to invite him on stage, uh, followed by the speakers for the session, Ms. Cynthia McKinney, former US Congresswoman and Commissioner in the Citizens Commission on 9-11. Mr. James Corbett, journalist and film producer, and Mr. Richard Gage, founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Please welcome them on stage. Thank you, Juan. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In taking this initiative today, the Padana Global Peace Foundation has joined adherents of the 9-11 Truth movements. Being distanced from the United States does not preclude us being members of a civil society to seek nothing more but the truth about 9-11. We read of the 9-11 uh, Commission report being discredited with remarks like uh, inconsistencies, questions unanswered, doubts being created, skepticism of the report, and conspiracy theories and a host of others. It is against this backdrop and above all that we in Malaysia do share the same values as the Americans of liberty, freedom and morality that uh, this initiative is undertaken by the Padana Global Peace Foundation to share with us today their thoughts and views of what actually happened, the truth behind it, are prominent and eminent personalities who have been involved and continues to be involved in the quest in seeking the truth. They are none other than, to my right, former Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, who is no stranger to Malaysia and to the PGPF, who currently is a PhD student. Very interesting indeed. <laughs> and then we have on my immediate left, Mr. James Cobbett, a film <laughs> producer and journalist. And finally, we have Richard Cage, founder of architects and engineers for 9-11 truth. 
Their credentials are well appended in the Slovenia program. I do not have to go through with you. And we have approximately until about 11.30 for this session. And on that note, I'd like to invite Cynthia to share her thoughts and views with us. She will take roughly about 21 minutes, she told me. <laughs> Cynthia, over to you. Okay, I think it'll be um, a little bit more than 21 minutes, maybe 22. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you this morning. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Those are the words of Mario Savio, a student organizer at the University of California at Berkeley in the 1960s. I was too young to understand them at the time, but I understand those words now. And I have organized my life around those words ever since. I decided that every day when I rise from my bed, I will ask myself, what can I do to resist? And so I've chosen to resist government lies and propaganda. Every day I resist war. I resist the daily insults to human and earth dignity. I'm proud to proclaim that I've chosen whose side I'm on. I'm on the side of truth. I'm on the side of justice. And I'm on the side of peace. I'm on the side of dignity. I am on Toon Dr. Mahathir's side. I am on Perdana's side. I am on the side to criminalize war. And that means I'm on your side. I want the people of Malaysia to be able to live without intrusions from non-Malaysians and for you to be able to resolve your issues without outside interference. And I want that for every people in every country on this planet. And I want the planet to be respected so that it can continue to sustain life and every life must be a life worth living. I'd like to thank Toon Dr. Mahathir and Toon Dr. Siti, the Perdana and Criminalize War families for inviting me to be here with you today. And I'd like to also thank all of you in the audience for supporting my presence here over the years. It was in 2005 that I first came to Kuala Lumpur and declared this beautiful, wonderful city to be the peace capital of the world. I've come back every year full of hope as I joined with the Perdana Peace Organization in pursuit of this illusory goal. But I have to admit that my optimism has begun to wane. My faith in this work is being tested. And while I'm absolutely certain of the correctness of our way, I've begun to ask different questions. For if we continue to do things as we have done them, I'm afraid we'll continue to get what we're getting now. So much talk about justice and so little justice. So much talk about peace and so little peace. And honestly, I'm tired of losing, precisely because I know that most people are good and honest. Most people want the best for their families and don't want to deny that to others. Most people want the truth and most people want peace. I want to take you back for just a moment to 2001. Republicans had just stolen the U.S. presidency, taking office against the will of U.S. voters in the 2000 election. And as a member of Congress, I investigated that. I was the only member of Congress to do so. After that, 
The big issue of 2001 was the Durban World Conference Against Racism. I headed the Congressional Black Caucus Task Force and went head to head and toe to toe with the pro-Israel lobby that was determined to have the U.S. boycott the conference so that Zionists wouldn't have to defend their practices against the Palestinians. So they did everything in their considerable power to win the argument. But it was such a bad argument. And I was just as determined to have the U.S. participate in the conference. And so they lost. And I went to Durban. And I took five members of the Congressional Black Caucus there with me. I had commissioned an investigation into murders of members of the Black Panther Party that had occurred as a result of a U.S. government program that targeted individuals because of their political beliefs. I hand-delivered that investigation to Mary Robinson, who was the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the U.N. at the time. I was particularly outraged about Durban because I was expected to give up the opportunity to, dis to discuss my grievances so they could avoid having a discussion about Zionism. So indigenous people from all over the planet being robbed of their sacred lands and even their right to life were not seen to be as an important part of a conversation. Africans still stinging from the loss of millions of individuals snatched from the continent in the massive transatlantic slave trade were to remain mute about how that crime against humanity affected them. Blacks in the diaspora, quiet about the indignities suffered on a daily basis. We were supposed to just forget our pain and suffer in silence because the Zionists didn't want us to talk about Palestine. To be honest, I didn't even know what a Zionist was. All I knew was that I had been asked to sign a pledge for Israel when I first became a candidate for Congress. And after refusing to do so, my congressional career became trench warfare, hand-to-hand -hand combat, just to remain in the Congress. Ever since my refusal to sign that pledge for Israel, the pro-Israel lobby let me know that my political neck was in the hangman's noose. It was the pro-Israel lobby that decided to tighten that noose when I questioned the Bush administration's actions on and after 9-1-1. I asked the question then, what did the administration know and when did it know it about the tragic events of September 11th? I was in Washington that day and experienced the most chaotic and confusing day of my life. But my gut told me that this was nothing new. I was experiencing what I had read about so many times before. I figuratively stepped outside of myself and watched as we members of Congress gathered on the Capitol steps. I was a critical observer at the members only briefings and I noticed everything. When I traveled to Europe and England, I encouraged citizen investigations of 911 and I learned that to question 911 was to be labeled an anti-Semite. Even more bizarre, those who questioned the tragedy were equated with Holocaust deniers, and I wondered why. By demanding an independent investigation of what happened on September 11th, I became a political pariah. I was vilified in the press, and the noose tightened around my district. The pro-Israel lobby found someone to run against me, gave her over a million dollars for her campaign, and then managed to make the election turn out the wrong way for me. Needless to say, I know now what a Zionist is. I wanted to take you back to those days because I think it's important for us as, a people, as people of color to understand where we were in the heady days of Durban. Europe abandoned the U.S. position and admitted that the transatlantic slave, tra slave trade was a crime against humanity. I met indigenous people from Latin America, from Peru, Ecuador, black people from Brazil and Colombia, First Nations people from all over North America, and we were making our way together. 
And then, on the morning of September 11th, 2001, the World Trade Center towers came falling down. The topic of conversation immediately changed, and today humanity is on the brink. We lost a lot that day. A new level of criminality and immorality has been breached. Whole societies are being wiped off the map while a sitting president of the United States openly advocates targeted assassination of U.S. citizens on U.S. soil. State crimes against democracy in the name of democracy have become the norm. And as with colonialism and neocolonialism, even our identity has become so warped we don't know who we are or what we should stand for, and so we are misled, acting on behalf of someone else's agenda, even to our own ultimate demise. All of this is the progeny of 11 September 2001. So what really happened on 11 September? Much more than I can say within my short time today. But the people all over the world hunger for the truth and refuse to let the lies stand. We need to know more. I'm saddened when I hear people say they are afraid. Afraid of what? Knowing that your government has been hijacked and that those in charge will lie to you? Such knowledge should actually set us free to do what we must to maintain our own dignity. And as if 1911 wasn't convincing enough of the need to fight Islamic terrorists after September, uh, September 2001. There was Bali, Madrid, London, and Mumbai. With bombs raining down on Gaza right now, I remember what the Israeli Prime Minister said. He said, we're all Israelis now. I agree that terrorism is a problem. And I know who the terrorists are. Dick Cheney told us to expect war for the next generation and drew up a list of 60 target countries. General Wesley Clark informed us of Pentagon plans to go to war against seven countries in five years. Iraq, Sudan, Somalia, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, and Iran. Syria is in process, and only Lebanon and Iran are left standing. But I'm sure their turn will come soon, too. General Wesley Clark called it a policy coup. He said that there had been a policy coup inside the United States. Not even one month ago, the former number two at the State Department, Lawrence Wilkerson, Colin Powell's right-hand man, said that what has happened in the U.S. is worse than a coup. The U.S. media would have you believe that the U.S. is divided. None white versus white, Christian versus Muslim, native born versus immigrant, white versus Latino. I disagree with that. I've traveled into every nook and cranny of the United States, and I can tell you that people are united and sick and tired of war. The meme of division is developed by those who write the scripts in order to pit us against each other. That way, we forget to focus on those who planned September 11th, those who profiteer from war and killing, and those who, like cowards, vote to send our young men and women off to fight someone else's wars or worse, remain silent even while whole countries are being destroyed. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that our lives begin to end the moment we remain silent about the things that really matter. He also said there comes a time when silence is betrayal. I heard those words too. So while I hope that my actions, combined with the actions of millions of others who also want justice and peace, will change the world, the best I can do right now is to change myself. I am now in a PhD program that I absolutely love, and I'm studying leadership and change. We need both. And I've added new meaning to that word in my vocabulary, resistance. I wake up every morning and I ask myself, what can I do to resist war and injustice today? Today is the beginning of people who hunger and thirst for the truth to come together. 
I know that there is a worldwide community that is ready to know what happened on September 11th, as I have said too many times. We all know what we saw, but how did it happen? As a member of Congress, I asked, how could the U.S. invest trillions of dollars in an intelligence and military infrastructure and it fail four times in one day? As a black person, I knew that the Bush administration explanation of the U.S. being hit because we were free couldn't hold water because an election had just been stolen and the people of the United States weren't free. And they're even less so today. This exercise in revisiting 911 and seeking the truth could serve a great cause in helping people have the courage to face the truth about our current course. This mere informational exercise with resolve could result in a concrete end to impunity. Finally, two thoughts. One, we need people with a moral compass in public office today. We need people willing to resist injustice and war in public office. Members of the Bush administration committed crimes against the American people, as well as international crimes, some of which have no statute of limitations. That continues under President Obama. The only way we can arrest this lawlessness is to hold them to account, not just in people's tribunals, which have their place, but also in courtrooms around the world. The last thing I want to mention is about stand-down orders. Pay very close attention to what is happening in the U.S. around Benghazi Gate, as it is being called. A U.S. ambassador and three security agents are dead because someone reportedly issued a stand-down order three times. At least one general has been fired reportedly because he ignored the stand-down order and went to the rescue. As we revisit Secretary of Transportation Mineta's 911 testimony, the issue of a stand-down order arises. If a stand-down order was given to allow events to transpire in Benghazi, might that be relevant in a different setting? In short, we must never again allow this level of criminality in those who have positional authority over us. Never again. Now, with the chairman's indulgence, I have a short video that I'd like to show that on how I practice my own resistance. Imagine the U.S. Imagine Israel-Palestine. Imagine Libya, Somalia, Yemen, and Pakistan. Imagine China and Russia. Imagine Latin America with, imagine Malaysia if we had average ordinary Americans with morality and compassion making U.S. foreign policy. Incredibly, just in the last few days, 535 members of Congress unanimously voted to support Israel's Operation Pillar of Cloud. And I'll conclude with this. Bobby Kennedy, who almost became President of the United States, but assassin's bullets cut him down instead, said, some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say, why not? This 911 International Conference could allow us to dream again. And for that reason alone, its efforts are welcome and well worth it. Thank you. So,
now is an old colleague and traveling companion, the former U.S. Congresswoman, former presidential candidate, Cynthia McKinney. She joined me on one of our convoys to Gaza. She's tried many times to get into Gaza. Israel has been determined to stop her. 26 minutes after the hour, continuing our breaking news coverage of the crisis in the Middle East. And this morning we told you about a 66-foot pleasure boat, the Dignity, which had been trying to deliver medical supplies, urgently needed medical supplies, to Gaza City. That boat, while according to our uh, CNN reporter Carl Penhall, who was on it at the time, was in international waters, was rammed by an Israeli patrol boat, and uh, there you see the, the boat itself, had to uh, make way back to Tyre in Lebanon as it was taking on water. Also on board that craft was former Georgia Congresswoman, former presidential candidate, Cynthia McKinney, and she joins us now via the internet uh, from Tyre in Lebanon. And uh, Congresswoman McKinney, can you tell us what happened? We had our Carl Penhall saying that you were in international waters, clearly in international waters, when accosted by the, and confronted by these Israeli patrol boats. Well, I wouldn't call it accosting. I would call it ramming. Let's just call it as it is. Our boat was rammed three times, twice in the front and one on the side. But let me also state for the record that what we experienced earlier today pales in comparison to what the people of Gaza are experiencing right now as we do this interview. We have been watching former Georgia Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney because she's traveling in the Muslim world saying awful things, awful things about her own country. The fact of the matter is that the American people by a vast majority agree with me that we need to bring our war dollars home. In 2005, when Representative Cynthia McKinney grilled Donald Rumsfeld during the House hearings on the 2006 budget for the U.S. Department of Defense. Let's listen to McKinney as she questions Rumsfeld on the missing trillions and hear Rumsfeld's pathetic response. I thank the uh, gentleman, the uh, gentlelady from uh, Georgia, Ms. McKinney. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I watched President Bush deliver a moving speech at the United Nations in September 2003, in which he, mission, he mentioned the crisis of the sex trade. The President called for the punishment of those involved in this horrible business. But at the very moment of that speech, DynCor was exposed for having been involved in the buying and selling of young women and children. While all of this was going on, DynCor kept the Pentagon contract to administer the smallpox and anthrax vaccine and is now working on a plague vaccine through the Joint Vaccine Acquisition Program. Mr. Secretary, is it policy of the U.S. government to reward companies that traffic in women and little girls? That's my first question. My second question, Correct. Mr. Secretary, according to the Comptroller General of the United States, there are serious financial pro management problems at the Pentagon, to which Mr. Cooper alluded. Fiscal year 1999, 2.3 trillion missing. Fiscal year 2000, 1.1 trillion missing. And DOD is the number one reason why the government can't balance its checkbook. The Pentagon has claimed year after year that the reason it can't account for the money is because its computers don't communicate with each other. My second question, Mr. Secretary, is who has the contracts today to make those systems communicate with each other? How long have they had those contracts? And how much have the taxpayers paid for them? Finally, Mr. Secretary, after the last hearing, I thought that my office was promised a written response to my question regarding the four war games on September 11th. I have not yet received that re response, but would like for you to respond to the questions that I've put to you today, and then I do expect the written response to my previous question, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Representative. First, the answer to your first question is, is no. Absolutely not. The policy of the United States government is uh, clear, unambiguous, and opposed to uh, to the activities that you described. The um, second question. Well, how do you explain the fact that um, DynCorp and its successor uh, companies have received and continue to receive government contracts? 
I would have to go and, and find the facts, but there are laws and rules and regulations with respect to government contracts, and there are times that corporations do things they should not do, in which case they tend to be suspended for some period. There are times then that, that the, under the laws and the rules and regulations for the, that uh, passed by the Congress and implemented by the executive branch, that corporations can get off of the pen, out of the penalty box, if you will, and, and be permitted to engage in contracts with the government. They're, they're not generally not barred in perpetuity. This contract, this company um, was never in the penalty box. If you could proceed to my second question, please. The, um, the second question, uh, I've forgotten what the second question was. I think Ms. Jonas knows it. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. McKinney. I appreciate the question. I appreciate your interest in uh, our department's financial uh, condition. And uh, we are working very hard on that program. I've just come back uh, recently. This I understand that you're working hard on it, but my question was, who has the contract? How long has that, have they had that contract? There are and how much money have we spent on it? Thank you, Cynthia. I like your remarks on uh, justice and truth, which is consistent exactly with the Security Council resolution related to the 9-11, that is bringing the perpetrators to justice. And uh, God willing, by the end of the day, the conference should be able to wrap up on those lines, justice and truth. With that, uh, I now like to invite uh, James to share with us your thoughts and views. You can use the podium if you like, James. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is needless to say an honor to be presenting to you today in the company of General Tan Sri and Congresswoman McKinney and Mr. Gage. I wish to sincerely thank the Perdana Global Peace Foundation for its uh, assembling such an esteemed panel on what I consider to be one of the defining geopolitical events of our era. The willingness to convene such a panel on the events of 9-11 and their continuing significance is to be heartily commended in this day and age, where so many now consider 9-11 to be yesterday's news, even as it continues to play the role of the terrorist boogeyman hiding under the bed of global geopolitics. I've been asked to present to you today on the topic of what happened at the Pentagon on 9-11, and as I'm sure you can imagine, I am humbled by the task of attempting to adequately present to you the thousands of pieces of evidence that would be needed to form any satisfactory answer to that very important question. Given the time constraints that we're operating under today, then I trust that, uh, that you will uh, forgive me in limiting the scope of that investigation to a consideration of the actions and perhaps more importantly, as we shall see, the inactions of those officials whose responsibilities make them most directly responsible for what happened at the Pentagon, not only on the day of September 11th, 2001, but in the months proceeding and preceding the event. Specifically, I intend to examine today the areas of responsibility, the decisions taken, and the orders given by former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and former Vice President Dick Cheney on the day of 9-11. It is my contention that a thorough examination of these individuals and their actions on and around 9-11 will itself establish the basis for a potential criminal investigation into the 189 lives lost at the Pentagon that day. First, let's examine the actions of former Defense Secretary Rumsfeld. 
As the top-ranking executive officer in the Department of Defense, Rumsfeld was, on the morning of 9-11, uh, as per U.S. Code Title 10, Section 113, second only to the President in the military hierarchy of the United States. Together with President Bush, Rumsfeld exercised the power of the National Command Authority, which includes joint control over the decision to launch a strategic nuclear weapons strike. Additionally, according to the 9-11 Commission's own final report, prior to 9-11, it was understood that an order to shoot down a commercial aircraft would have to be issued by the National Command Authority. By the 9-11 Commission's own account, we know that President Bush, attending an event at an elementary school in Sarasota, Florida, was effectively removed from decision-making during the hours of the attacks themselves. According to the official narrative of the attacks, the President did not have an open channel of communication with Washington, could not reach key officials for extended periods of time, could not maintain contact with the White House shelter conference room, did not talk to Vice President Cheney until 9.45, almost 10 minutes after Flight 77 hit the Pentagon, and did not talk to Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld until after 10 a.m. Thus, Rumsfeld was, by default, the highest-ranking military authority in Washington that morning, and the only one with the authority to issue a shoot-down order during the time of the Pentagon attack. Given Secretary Rumsfeld's vital importance in the chain of command on 9-11, a careful study of his response to the attacks that morning are in order. The record of Rumsfeld's actions on 9-11 are well documented and themselves not a matter of controversy. This is Rumsfeld's own statement to the 9-11 Commission about his whereabouts that morning. Quote, on the morning of September 11, 2001, I was hosting a meeting for some, some of the members of Congress. Ironically, in the course of the conversation, I stressed how important it was for our country to be adequately prepared for the unexpected. Someone handed me a note that a plane had hit one of the World Trade Center towers. Later, I was in my office with a CIA briefer when I was told a second plane had hit the other tower. Shortly thereafter, at 9.38 a.m., the Pentagon shook with an explosion of a then-unknown origin. I went outside to determine what had happened. I was not there long, apparently, because I am told I was back in the Pentagon with the crisis action team by shortly before or after 10 a.m. The implications of this statement alone are remarkable. By 9.05 a.m., two minutes after United Flight 175 hit the South Tower of the World Trade Center, it was generally understood among senior government officials that, in the infamous words of White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card, America is under attack. Yet at this time, the top-ranking military officer in the United States government, the only one in the loop that day with the ability to give the authority to shoot down hostile civilian aircraft, made no attempt whatsoever to coordinate a response to this acknowledged attack. He did not establish the details of the flights involved or possible other hostile aircraft with NORAD or the FAA. He did not make any effort to determine what interceptors, if any, had been launched in response to the two jets in New York. And he certainly did not issue any directions for intercepting any other potential aircraft. Instead, by his own account, he proceeded with a regularly scheduled meeting with his CIA briefer, Denny Watson. It's important to note that Rumsfeld act, Rumsfeld's activity, I'm sorry, it's important to note that Rumsfeld actively deflected attempts by his staff to engage him in that crucial window of the time that Flight 77 was bearing down on the Pentagon. According to Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs, Victoria Clark, she and other key DOD staffers had gone into Rumsfeld's office to, quote, tell him that the crisis pro uh, management process was starting up. But Rumsfeld insisted that he needed to make a few phone calls and proceed with his regularly scheduled 9.30 briefing. Instead, he told Clark to wait for him in the Executive Support Center. During the entire time that Flight 77 approached the Pentagon, Rumsfeld proceeded with his business as usual. During this 35-minute window of time between the second strike on the, on the Twin Towers and the crash of Flight 77 into the Pentagon at 9.38 a.m., the incalculably complex interlocking mechanisms of the most sophisticated defense system in the history of the world sprang into action. Counterterrorism Chief Richard Clark established a video conference to coordinate a crisis response to the attacks. 
The FAA Command Center issued a ground stop for all air traffic landing or transitioning through New York, Boston, Cleveland, and Washington air centers. The Northeast Air, Def Sorry, the Northeast air Defense Sector of NORAD launched F-15s to establish a combat air patrol over New York City. Yet throughout it all, the chief executive in command of the United States military in the president's absence sat in his office giving no outward indication that he was aware of any of these activi activities and certainly making no effort to involve himself with any of them. Then, when the plane finally did hit the Pentagon, once again, the most important person in the military chain of command abandoned his post altogether, theoretically jeopardizing himself and demonstrably obstructing the military response to any other potential attackers to participate in a meaningless photo opportunity on the lawn of the Pentagon, helping first responders to carry the wounded into an ambulance. Uh, was in his uh, suite of offices on the other side of the building from the impact zone. He felt it, um, and he immediately was on the attack site within moments, uh, much to the displeasure of his security people, but he did it. And there are pictures of the secretary helping other men carry stretchers of the injured. At that point, it was still over 20 minutes before Rumsfeld would even talk to President Bush. And in that short communication, the decision of whether to issue a shoot-down order for further hostile aircraft was not even discussed. The issue of when and how that shoot-down order was eventually issued, or whether it was issued at all, is an extremely important one, but it lies outside the boundaries of our examination of the Pentagon today. But it is self-evident that Rumsfeld made no attempt to engage his shoot-down authority or even make himself available for a decision on the exercise of that authority during the fr first crucial hour of the attack on the United States. Nor can Rumsfeld claim ignorance of these issues. During the Reagan administration in the 1980s, both Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney were intimately involved with the creation of the very continuity of government operational protocols which were activated that day. The significance of this fact becomes even more apparent when we examine the actions of Vice President Dick Cheney during this same attack window. Unlike the whereabouts and actions of Rumsfeld during the lead-up to the attack on the Pentagon, the precise location of Vice President Dick Cheney and the timing of his movements are in considerable doubt. The 9-11 Commission itself slightly evades this question in their final report by noting, quote, there is conflicting evidence about when the Vice President arrived in the emergency shel the shelter conference room aka the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, or PIOC. We have concluded from the available evidence that the Vice President arrived in the room shortly before 10 o'clock, perhaps at 9.58. The Commission left the heavy lip lifting of establishing this fact to a single footnote at the end of the report, where the evidence in favor of this conclusion is presented, including the PIOC log, Secret Service notes, and various testimony. What they do not address, however, is what the conflicting evidence of this timing indicated or how they addressed this conflicting evidence. One critical piece of that conflicting evidence came from former Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta, who testified to the Commission that the Vice President was already in the PIOC when he arrived at 9.20. And then, according to Mineta, about five or six minutes later, the following conversation took place between the Vice President and a young man in the PIOC. Uh, during the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon, uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, uh, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. 
Have you heard anything to the contrary? Well, at the time, I didn't know what all that meant. And... Um, the flight you're referring to is the... The one flight that came into the Pentagon. Pentagon, yeah. If true, this is exceptionally significant. This timeline and account completely counters the narrative of the 9-11 Commission and establishes an entirely different understanding of the air defenses that morning. According to the Commission, the government was not notified of, sorry, the, the government was not notified of Flight 77's approach until 9.36, meaning there would have been no time for the confirmation of orders given in Mineta's account. In Mineta's version, the Vice President and others were monitoring as Flight 77 approached and finally hit the Pentagon. Yet no evacuation orders were given at the Pentagon. Defense Secretary Rumsfeld was not informed or contacted. Nothing at all was done to warn those in the building of the plane's approach. This is obviously not a trivial matter. So how did the 9-11 Commission address this discrepancy? By completely ignoring it. The Commission makes no mention of Mineta's testimony relative to the timing of Cheney's arrival in the PIOC and the video of Mineta's testimony is not available on the Commission's publicly accessible video archive. Some have argued that Mineta is merely mistaken regarding the timing of what he witnessed. The Commission itself places the incident referred to by Mineta between the Vice President and the aide as taking place not at 9.25 as Flight 77 approached the Pentagon, but sometime between 10.10 and 10.15, implying that the entire incident was in fact referring to the approach of Flight 93 the last plane to be taken down that day. Mineta, for his part, has repeatedly told the exact same story with the exact same timeline in interview after interview over the years, often with remarkable levels of specific detail regarding the timing and the order of the events in question. Some young man came in and said to the vice president, there's a plane uh, 50 miles out uh, coming towards DC. So I said to Monty uh, Felger, who's the number two at FAA, I said, Monty, what do you have on radar on this plane coming in? He said, well, the transponder's been turned off, so we don't know who it is, uh, and we don't know the altitude or speed. And um, so uh, I said, well, where is it? He said, well, it's somewhere beyond uh, Great Falls right now. And so, uh, then uh, the young man came in and said, it's 20 miles away. And uh, so we're, I'd say, well, Monty, where is this plane in relationship to the ground? And you know, the radar, it's hard to associate with a ground point, but they'd be able to tell you roughly the distance from wherever you are. Um, and, but he couldn't tell you speed or altitude. And then all of a sudden, as I was talking to him, he said, uh, oh, I lost the uh, bogey, lost the target. I said, well, where is it? He said, well, somewhere between um, Roslyn and uh, National Airport. And about that time, someone broke into the conversation. He said, Mr. Secretary, we just had a confirmation from an Arlington County police officer saying that he saw a, an American Airlines plane go into the Pentagon. So then I said, Monty, bring all the airplanes down. When you see one of something happen, it's an accident. When you see two of the same thing happening, it's a trend, some, something. When you see three, it's a plan. So I said, bring all the planes down. In the most stunning confirmation of this timeline, Mineta was directly questioned as to whether he may have been mistaken on the timing of Cheney's presence in the PIOC and the conversation with the aide, not by commission investigators, nor by journalists from the mainstream American news networks, but by independent grassroots citizens activists who talked to him after a speaking event. Uh, my main concern is that in your testimony, you stated that Vice President Dick Cheney came into the, uh, the e POEC yeah, office at 9.20 at is when you arrived and he was already there. He's gone in front of Meet the Press and he said that he was there at 9.38. Yet the 9-11 Commission report puts him there at 9.58 that morning. 58? Yeah, 
I don't, I don't know if you got a chance to read it, but it no. tells him half an hour later. So I don't mean to ask a rhetorical yeah. question, but to the best of your recollection, was Vice President Dick Cheney already oh, there absolutely. At when you arrived? Now, I might have been mistaken on the 925, but he was already there. But I, it wasn't... It wasn't 10. It was 9, a 958. Yeah, that puts him 38 oh, minutes no, no, later, no. which does not make sense to no, us at all. No, I don't know how that comes about. So, and I mean, it goes against your testimony, and it goes, it goes against his own testimony. I yeah. mean, the press, where he said he was there at 938, that's a full yeah. 38 minutes. So, to the best no, of your no, recollection, he was already there. Oh, absolutely. Given that there is no record of any kind for a shootdown being issued by President Bush until 10.20 a.m., and given that Rumsfeld was, as we have seen, completely out of the loop, how could the orders referred to in Secretary Mineta's testimony be a shootdown order? Only Bush and Rumsfeld, as National Command authorities, had the ability to issue such an order. Thus, what else can we infer about that, uh, that order than that the Vice President uh, was confirming a stand-down order. This should not be a difficult story to independently corroborate. Surely all the commission had to do was confirm the details of this story with the aide himself. And as it turns out, they did. The aide in question was identified in 2010 by independent 9-11 researcher James Dorman as this man, Naval Aid and Vice Presidential Emergency Action Officer Douglas Cochran. According to the Commission's own notes, Cochrane was interviewed on April 16, 2004, but all details of that interview have been classified. Why have the details of that interview been classified? What information did it contain, and why can the public still not know that information now, 11 years after the events? The pattern that is forming in our investigation today is an ominous one indeed. It points to the deliberate hobbling of the air defense by a defense secretary who refused to inv involve himself in the response to the largest foreign attack on American soil in history. It also paints the disturbing picture of a vice president who watched as an airplane approached the very heart of the American defense establishment without so much as bothering to warn any of the personnel there. To what end would two of the highest ranking officials in the United States government deliberately hinder, interfere with, or stand down the air defenses that morning? From the moment that Rumsfeld assumed office as head of the Pentagon, he was dealing with one of the greatest scan accounting scandals in the history of the government, and an inability to account for staggering sums of money in the Defense Department's budget. By the time he took over as Defense Secretary, a Defense, Aud uh, Defense Department audit of fiscal year 1999 found $2.3 trillion of transactions and adjustments were improperly accounted for. To understand the scope of the concern, a report from 2000 confirmed that the DOD had processed $7.6 trillion in department-level accounting transactions the previous year, with audit trails only capable of supporting $3.5 trillion of that. According to the department's own audits, $2.3 trillion of those entries were simply made up to make the, the, uh, the accounts balance. Political pressures regarding the issue continued mounting throughout 2001, and Rumsfeld's Pentagon was under considerable pressure to get to the bottom of this issue. As a result, he gave a press conference on September 10th, 2001, announcing that the Pentagon was at war with a new enemy bureaucracy. The very next day, Flight 77 crashed into the newly renovated wet wedge on the western side of the Pentagon. This is a picture of the location of the victims of the Pentagon attack that was released as part of the prosecution exhibits at the trial of Zacharias Musawi. It depicts the offices that were destroyed in the attack, including the office of Resource Services Washington, a team of 65 civilian accountants, bookkeepers, and budget analysts, 34 of whom died on September 11, 2001. As a Pittsburgh Post-Gazette article of December 20, 2001 noted, Robert Jaworski, the director of the office, was faced with the task of choosing which of his colleagues' funerals he would attend because he could not physically attend them all. The office's role in processing information regarding the unaccounted for $2.3 trillion has never been established by outside researchers and in fact has never even been inquired into by professional journalists. 
An Arlington County After Action report on the rescue and cleanup response at the Pe Pentagon, however, notes that, quote, it was also the end of the fiscal year and important budget information was in the damaged area. 9-11 <clears throat> researchers will see the parallels between this information and the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7, the 47-story sto steel frame office tower that collapsed into its own footprint at 5.20 in the afternoon of 9-11, despite never having been hit by a plane. That building, too, housing the New York offices of the Securities and Exchange Commission, along with a host of government agencies, including the CIA, DOD, U.S. Secret Service, and others, was a repository of key financial records. Although the SEC did not reveal how many active investigations files were destroyed in the collapse of the building, Reuters and the LA Times estimated the number at three to 4,000, allegedly including documents pertaining to the Enron scandal. As for the $2.3 trillion unaccounted for in fiscal year 1999, it was followed by $1.1 trillion in fiscal year 2000. Such was the distraction that 9-11 provided from this particular issue that it virtually disappeared from the public spotlight overnight, aided by a Congress with an exceptional unwillingness to pursue the tough questions on this issue. A Congress, that is, with one notable and very courageous exception. So, you, you might already be familiar with this, but let's watch it again. That's my first question. My second question, Correct. Mr. Secretary, according to the Comptroller General of the United States, there are serious financial pro management problems at the Pentagon, to which Mr. Cooper alluded. Fiscal year 1999, 2.3 trillion missing. Fiscal year 2000, 1.1 trillion missing. And DOD is the number one reason why the government can't balance its checkbook. The Pentagon has claimed year after year that the reason it can't account for the money is because its computers don't communicate with each other. My second question, Mr. Secretary, is who has the contracts today to make those systems communicate with each other? Okay, we've just watched that clip, so we'll move on. But thank you, wholeheartedly thank you for bringing this issue up. This is, of course, not to suggest that September 11th was nothing more than an excuse to disguise financial fraud. There are any number of questions that need to be answered about what took place that day that point to many different, perhaps complementary, explanations for some of the unresolved issues of 9-11, not least of which both Rumsfeld and Cheney's participation, along with a host of top-ranking Bush administration officials, in a think tank called the Project for a New American Century, which produced a report one year in advance of the attacks, citing the need for a new Pearl Harbor to justify the enormous expenditures that would be required to maintain American global military hegemony into the 21st century. However, the issue of the budget analysis does, I posit, present a somewhat more plausible explanation for why that particular section of the Pentagon was targeted that day than the official narrative, which asks us to believe that Hani Hanjur, a pilot so incompetent that he was not allowed to rent a Cessna because of how poorly he flew on a test flight, decided to approach the Pentagon from the wrong direction before performing an 8,000 foot descending 270 degree corkscrew turn at 400 miles per hour to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in a mostly deserted, newly renovated wing of the Pentagon on the far side of the building from where Defense Secretary Rumsfeld and the Pentagon's top brass were sitting. In summation, any real investigation into criminal complicity in 9-11 would have to look at the issue of the movements, actions, and inactions of Defense Secretary Rumsfeld and Vice President Cheney on that day. Any such investigation would proceed by one, establishing the reasoning behind Rumsfeld's complete abdication of his command responsibilities in the midst of a full-scale attack on the country, as well as the failure of all subsequent investigations to pursue this line of inquiry or to hold him accountable for his inaction. Two, establishing the nature of the discrepancy between the official estimate of Cheney's arrival at the PIOC and Mineta's account, including requiring the official, public, on the record, under oath testimony of Cheney and Bush about what occurred that morning, something that I will parenthetically add the 9-11 Commission did not do. Number three, the declassification of Douglas Cochran's testimony and all other relevant testimony from the 9-11 Commission's archives and, where necessary, taking that testimony again in a more impartial manner than that conducted by the Commission. 
I regret that I've only been able to scratch the surface of the evidence pointing to the criminal action and inaction of the officers responsible for what happened on 9-11 in the limited time that we have here today. But I would, however, like to once again extend my sincere thanks to the Perdana Global Peace Foundation for organizing this conference and encouraging further inquiry into these events. For if Orwell's ominous dictum that he who controls the past controls the future is indeed true, then it is my profound conviction that an honest criminal investigation into the true complicity and cover-ups at the heart of 9-11 will afford us a chance to steer the world of the next 10 years towards peace, justice, and reconciliation, just as assuredly as the refusal to pursue that inv investigation has steered the world toward war, injustice, and suffering for the previous 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. And you have really uh, set the pace for the fourth session for today to start working on with your inputs on the investigations. And uh, dereliction of duty is something that's very serious. And um, business as usual, when a national catastrophe, calamity takes place for a very senior personality in office is something to ponder on. There must be something behind it. Anyway, once again, thanks, uh, James. And now it leaves me to invite Richard Cage. Uh, Richard is well known for his uh, enthusiasm, quest from the technical perspective of the 9-11 with regards to buildings. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, General. Good evening, everybody. I'm deeply honored to speak here today in Kuala Lumpur at this international conference on 9-11 in front of our most distinguished hosts, speakers, and guests, where I understand that at least 30 representatives of embassies from around the world are present. The 1,700 architects and engineers that I have the honor to represent are technical and building professionals who have put their reputations on the line and have nothing to gain in order to bring this evidence to the eyes of the world. In this brief address, I'll only be able to give you a few of the highlights of the overwhelming volume of clear forensic evidence, video, and eyewitness testimony that concerns them so very much, and that is available on our websites, ae911truth.org, 911expertsspeakout.org, and 911explosiveevidence.org. These experts rely on the scientific method. We've had it for about a hundred years in the West. We formulate a question. How did the towers come down? We do some background research, make some observations, and come up with our best guess. We construct a hypothesis, make predictions from that hypothesis. I think it came down by fires. No, I think maybe it came down by controlled demolition. No hypothesis is left untouched. We test these hypotheses with experiments, analyze the results, and draw conclusions. If the hypothesis is corroborated, we report the results in an open, transparent manner for all to see and for bodies of scient scientists to build on the work of others. If the hypothesis is not corroborated, we go back and come up with a hypothesis that stands a better chance against the evidence. So let's apply the scientific method today. What are the, the forces that destroy buildings. There are many, of course. Fire is certainly one of them. Fire moves through an office building every 20 minutes or so in a given area. 
burning up the fuel that's available, looking for fresh new fuel sources. So it's an asymmetrical collapse when buildings come down due to fires. The building would fall over, not straight down through the path of greatest resistance. So uh, you'll note that though no high-rise fire has ever come down uh, due to no high-rise has ever come down due to fire in the history of high-rises. And there's been dozens and dozens of very hot, large, and long-lasting fires in these buildings. Buildings also are blown up sometimes. These buildings exploded. There's thick volumes of pyroclastic-like smoke with entrained pulverized building materials. There's witnesses that hear sounds of explosions. They see flashes of light. When we have these characteristics, we know that a building has been blown up with explosives. It's very different from fires. Now, some buildings can be blown up with a series of highly engineered explosives, such as these. They're called controlled demolitions. We have hundreds of examples from all across the world to draw upon. And the way this is done is they take, uh, put thousands of explosives in the building and then synchronistically uh, floor by floor detonate them, which allows the building to come down symmetrically, smoothly, at free fall acceleration nearly. So there are a series of features associated with these controlled demolitions. We have a sudden onset, usually at the base of the structure, the onset of destruction. We have a straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's footprint because demolition waves remove the column supports. This results in a free fall acceleration as fast as a bowling ball falling off the side of the building and resulting in the total dismemberment of the steel structure ready for loading and shipment. There's minimal damage, of course, to adjacent structures. And there's sounds and flashes of explosions heard and seen by witnesses. There's enormous clouds of pyroclastic-like uh, smoke with entrained building solids. There's explosive charges that go off at different areas, uh, the wrong timing, perhaps. These are called squibs, or isolated explosive ejections. And of course, chemical evidence, debris left in the pile afterwards of explosives. This is all direct evidence of explosives. And guess what? Fire can't be responsible for any one of these, let alone all of them. And if we have additional supporting governmental documentation, experts agree. Yeah, that's a controlled demolition. Foreknowledge, these are planned months in advance. This is all proof of controlled demolition. Well, with that in mind, why don't we take a look at the third skyscraper to be destroyed on 9-11? How many of you knew that two planes brought down three skyscrapers on 9-11? Most architects and engineers know nothing about the third worst structural failure in modern history. 47-story World Trade Center 7, the tallest building in most of the states in the U.S. It wasn't hit by an airplane. Uh, and yet, at about 5.20 in the afternoon, this building suffers the collapse that we'll take a look at. And then we'll compare the features of this building's destruction to those of a controlled demolition, starting with, is there a sudden onset of destruction at the base of the building? Let's listen to newscaster Dan Rather. What you're seeing are high shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by world place dynamite to knock it down. Well, that's an interesting commentary. Let's uh, take a closer look. Is there a straight down symmetrical collapse into this building's footprint? Let's look from West Street. Pretty straight down, pretty symmetrical. Watch the penthouse drop a second before the overall building comes down indicating core column damage, massive simultaneous core column damage. Well, I'm not convinced yet. 
Let's compare World Trade Center 7 next to a, an explosive controlled demolition on the right. Is there any similarity? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? And yet NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who was tasked by Congress with explaining this collapse to us, never even looked at this possibility, even though every high-rise that has been brought down has been brought down with this technology, and no high-rise has been brought down by fire. The chief culprit, according to NIST, and these are the worst fires that we have photographic or video evidence of in these buildings. And they were out an hour prior to the building's collapse on the floors where we were told the initiation of collapse occurred. And of course, it drops straight down neatly, almost into its own footprint. How does that happen? How do we bring a building straight down? We have to take out all 80 columns in the building virtually simultaneously. Does fire have that level of precision? And how fast does this building come down? You can see the building gaining additional speed, additional distance with every second, indicating free fall. What is free fall? I'm going to drop this bottle. It's going to fall. Three, two, one. That's how fast this building dropped in just six and a half seconds. How does that happen? All of the resistance has to be removed. That's why it's called free fall. How does that happen? Well, whatever made that happen, it's responsible also for the total dismemberment of the steel structure, such that a 47-story skyscraper falls like a house of cards into a pile just three or four or five stories tall. And of course, there are at least half a dozen witnesses that hear explosions, like Kevin McPadden, first responder. And then it was like another two, three seconds, you heard explosions, like boom. It's like a distinct sound. It's not like when in compression, like boom, 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 like floors that were dropping and collapsing. This was ba boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was ex an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. Explosions like this, perhaps. Yeah, here's one of the guys who can tell you I'm okay, all right? Here, hold on. You want, call, you want to call your mother or something? None of these explosions are a part of the official story. Why not? Is there chemical evidence left behind in the residue? We'll come back to this in a moment. But these first eight characteristics, of course, are direct evidence of explosive destruction. Fire can't account for any one of them, let alone all eight of them. If fire was to bring any building down, surely it would have been World Trade Center 5 fully engulfed. Did it come down? No. Steel frame, high-rise, mid-rise office buildings do not come down as a result of fire. Yet these fires brought this building down in six and a half seconds, completely destroyed. Does it make sense? Not according to the 20-year controlled demolition expert 27-year controlled demolition expert Danny Jawenko, the top European controlled demolition uh, company. It starts from below. They've simply blown away the columns. This is controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. It's professional work without a doubt. He made this statement not having been aware of what happened uh, that this building had come down on 9-11. Was there any foreknowledge of this building's destruction? Let's listen to these mysterious construction workers walking away from Building 7, looking back after hearing an explosion and saying this. Do they know that the building is about to blow up? 
Interestingly enough, Kevin McPadden, who's listening to a radio held in the hands of a Red Cross worker, hears this. At the last few seconds, he took his hand off, and you heard three, two, one. Do fires bring buildings down to countdowns? Jane Stanley of the BBC is on the job. She reports the collapse of this building 20 minutes before it happened. They s apologize for this confusing error, citing the uh, very confusing events of the day. Does this make them psychic? Well, the hypothesis of explosive controlled demolition appears to be corroborated. In fact, all eight of the controlled demolition features are provided here, indicating direct evidence.